there's a major problem with music production gear that I don't really see addressed all that much. I'm not going to bury the lead. That problem is friction. Here on this channel, I spend a lot of time talking and showing ways to engage with music production from a hardware perspective and from the perspective of a hardcore hobbyist or someone with music as a side hustle. That's the category that I myself fall into. I'm a full-time civil engineer. I do all of this ridiculousness as something that I just kind of can't help myself but do. And I often find myself with not enough time or not enough energy, that's the key one, to get everything that I want to get done, done. And I'm guessing that's the case for a lot of you watching this as well. Hardcore hobbyists slash side hustle musicians enjoying hardware but finding it tough to always find the time or energy to make music. And the friction associated with using music production hardware specifically could be killing your music production. And I want to go into this from a few like aspects. For one thing, from the point of view of the prospective buyer, from the point of view of a gear user, and even from the point of view of a gear manufacturer and how we can reduce this. So when I say friction, I do mean something roughly analogous to real life physical friction. When you're say pushing a block on a table, you have to apply a certain amount of force to get over the amount of friction between the table and the object. In productivity terms, that is the kind of startup energy to get yourself to start a certain task or to get yourself to keep going through a process. And I should make clear upfront, different people have different tolerances for like levels of fiddliness when it comes to their music production setup. For me personally, I'm pretty lazy and I don't like clutter and I don't like anything that even feels a tiny bit like clutter. And so my like friction tolerance is pretty low, but some of you might be uh, more willing to spend more time tinkering and maybe even enjoy that process more. Whereas for me personally, I like to get into the music production process as quickly as possible and employ an almost move fast and break things approach. I just want to give that disclaimer up front that this will vary for different people, but I think it's something that's good to think about and something good to interrogate as you kind of tinker with your music production process and see what works and what doesn't work for you. So with that being said, one big source of friction for me personally is setup. The longer it takes for me to set up a music production setup, the more likely it is that I'm just not going to bother. And this is not even always a conscious thing. A good example of this is the example of let's, let's say you're trying to learn guitar and trying to practice guitar more often. If you were to put that guitar into a case and put it under your bed, you're probably a lot less likely to just randomly pull it out and start practicing than if it was just sitting on a stand in the middle of the room. If it's sitting on a stand in the middle of the room, you're probably more likely to just absentmindedly pick it up and start playing, thereby practicing more often. And maybe it's something that for the first couple of months you're really excited about, so it doesn't really matter where the guitar is because you're absolutely going to pull that thing out and start practicing. But as time goes on, maybe the novelty wears off, maybe real life gets in the way. And so anything that you can do to lower the friction associated with picking up that guitar is something that I think is worth doing. You could say, well, if this thing is so important to you, you should do whatever it takes to do it. And I agree with that, but I'm going to include within doing whatever it takes, lowering friction. And so for music production hardware, you have to maybe plug stuff in, you have to maybe route stuff. And so I try to think of ways that I can bypass that. For one thing, by just buying battery powered devices, there's a reason that devices like the Novation Circuits or Roland MC101 get a lot of use from me. Not just because I know them really well, although that is a fact that we'll get into in a second, but because I can just go to that shelf back there and absentmindedly pick them up, turn them on and start tinkering and start working on music. And that's it. And that's great. Some of those other devices you have to plug in. And that's such a tiny thing, but it's just a quick little, well, nah, moment that I try to bypass. For instance, I've bought some of these little uh, cable holder thingies that you can stick to the back of a desk. And I have a few of those strategically stuck to the back of my desk for things like audio cables running to my audio interface. And I also have one for my laptop cable so I can just kind of pull it out and it's right there ready to go. I could also do this for say my MPC-1 cable or my MC-707 cable if 
I wanted to have this be kind of a more permanent place for me to use those devices. As it is, I have those cables wound up and right next to their respective devices at all times. That way, all I have to do is just pick up the device and its corresponding cable at the same time and then plug that in. But I just want to put it in your brain that like even plugging a device in can be a source of friction. And if thinking of a workaround is what it takes to get you to make more music, I would suggest doing that. That's also why personally, I don't really like using the kind of table full of gear set up with a groove box as a brain and a bunch of little other external like synths and effects. That takes setup time. I can't cannibalize this desk for a permanent setup like that. And so I'm much less likely to want to go through the effort of routing everything and connecting everything. And so I often just don't do it. And for me, that's not a huge priority for me anyway, so I've made my peace with that. Once again, if you can figure out ways to have MIDI cables easily accessible or some stuff pre-routed even, that could help you reduce friction and get into the music making process more quickly. But here's the biggest thing that is a source of friction and that is a device's user interface. And the frustrating bit about this is that this will vary from person to person. Different people will have different tolerances for things like menu diving or uh, step editing. Different people have different tolerances for that. Different people's brains work differently and will gravitate towards different things. And so sometimes people say, I love the workflow of this device. And other people will talk about the same device and say the workflow is the worst part of it. That's something we're going to have to deal with. And all I can say is, Hopefully videos will help you see what a device is like in action. And when you're watching those, be realistic with yourself. Don't assume that you're gonna be using this device as your kind of superhuman future version of yourself that doesn't actually exist. Assume that you're gonna be using that device as your laziest and most uninspired version of yourself and see then does that interface still seem like it would speak to me or does it seem like it would be way too much of a pain in the ass for me to bother with? I'm gonna use some specific examples and I just wanna like put up front, these are all devices that I like and I think are objectively good, but I'm gonna talk a little bit of shit. So there's something like the Innovation Circuits, which have, I think, some of the better interface design in the Groovebox world. They are very fast to work with, and in my opinion, very intuitive for the way that my brain works. For that matter, I've even found the Roland MC-101, once you've memorized some shortcuts and developed some key muscle memory, I found the Roland MC-101 is actually really fast to work with. Is that because that's one of the earliest groove boxes I got and I've used it a lot? Probably, but I tend to find that smaller groove boxes allow for better muscle memory for me personally. and feel less intimidating to work with and reduce the friction associated with going through the different steps of the music production process. I've also found things like the machine or the MPC-1, once I got over the initial hump, especially for the MPC-1, to be very smooth workflows once I figured out how to adapt them for my own particular purposes. And I'm going to address some ways to adapt a workflow to have less friction in a second. But there are also devices like the Polyand Tracker or the MC-707. Those have a significantly higher amount of friction associated with using them for me personally. And the wild thing is, is that it's not even anything major or even all that quantifiable. It just often feels like for those devices, each thing that I want to do takes a couple extra steps from what I'm used to. And that is enough to make me second guess whether or not I want to say, go change a part or go to the next step of the music production process. Maybe I'm less likely to leave the eight bar loop phase of songwriting that is so common in music production because I kind of feel like the setup costs of fleshing that song out are gonna be just a little bit too annoying. Once again, this is not always conscious. Sometimes it's just a subconscious thing where your brain just kind of kicks in the, I don't feel like it. And maybe you can push past that, but sometimes you kind of have to do that on purpose. And for something like the Polyand Tracker MC-707, if either of those was the only music production device I had, I could absolutely continue to have a pretty high musical output with them. But it would feel a bit more 
laborious. It would feel a bit more intensive and I would have to be a lot more intentional about forcing myself to finish songs than with a device that has fewer steps to get the same results and to a degree, even fewer choices. It's also worth noting that the more devices you have, the more you might encounter this because the less well you know a device, the more you're gonna have to think actively about how to use it or even look stuff up to get yourself using it. So I find I still go back to devices that I've had for a long time or I've used the most. It becomes a self-perpetuating cycle where I like a device, therefore I use it a lot, therefore I get to know it really well, therefore I like it even more, and that just becomes a feedback loop. I do want to talk about a couple methods for reducing friction with devices, though. One thing that's been huge for me is the concept of sound packs. And what I mean by that is basically any collection of sounds that exists as a unit where maybe you have a folder of 16 sounds or you have a sound pack file that you can load in in one step and just have a bunch of sounds on your pads or keys or whatever. I was introduced to this by, for one thing, the Novation circuits, which must have sound packs. That's how you load sounds onto them. That's just the way that they work. And when I was getting into the machine, you can buy machine kits that load up and populate across the pads in one single step. And I found this tremendously inspiring because I didn't have to have that startup time of hunting for sounds. I would just grab a sound pack that sounded vaguely like what I felt like making and just go. And then I want some more sounds, I'll just load another sound pack and maybe I'll keep stacking sound packs. And that for me led to an explosion of beat making and music production. I started a shit ton of songs and finished quite a lot of them because I was able to get over the startup friction of loading in sounds because I had packs to load in. And this doesn't have to be something that you buy. For instance, machine kits, quite expensive, not always worth it. If you want me to do a dedicated video reviewing machine kits, by the way, let me know. That's been sitting on the ideas list forever and I kind of want an excuse to do it. Regardless, I have adapted this for a lot of other devices. For instance, uh, I use the software Kit Maker to convert machine kits to MPC format. That way I can load them into my MPC one. And now that I don't have the machine plus anymore because I had that on loan, the MPC one with the workflow of just loading in a bunch of kits and getting to work, that's replaced the machine for me. Then I'll load in a couple of key group programs and then I have pretty much everything I need to just like get going and get right to the creative bits. Then I can load in cherry picked sounds as I need to. The other nice thing about Kitmaker, not a sponsor by the way, the other nice thing about Kitmaker is that it will take folders full of sounds and automatically assemble them into kits. Once again, machine kits, MPC kits. I use this all the time. Anytime I download a sample pack from a producer that I like or collect a bunch of sounds of my own, I'll try to just automatically convert those into a bunch of kits that once again, I can load in willy-nilly as I please. And that whole process is made as easy and painless as possible, making me more likely to do it, making me more likely to make more music. And even if the device you're using doesn't accommodate literal kit formats, even just loading multiple similar sounds or say a kick, snare, hi-hat, percussion, a few synth and bass one shots into separate folders. And then when you get them onto the device, just rapid fire loading all those samples in a row on something like say the Polyon Tracker, that could still help you shortcut the sound selection process. I don't think it's a coincidence that on the Dirty Wave Mate, I usually find myself designing sounds from scratch with its built-in synth engines, partially just as a like, hey, because I can, I'm going to, and that's fun, but partially because I often can't be bothered to load in samples and will just reach for a synth engine and start tweaking it. Another major source of friction is the song finishing stage. And once again, this is something that is intensely personal and probably contentious. For me, I don't mind the friction associated with exporting stems from a groove box and finishing them in my DAW. I like the control a DAW gives me, and I think that structuring a loop or a few loops into a full song is easier on a DAW than it is on most groove boxes. However, other people will find dealing with a DAW in its entirety to be a source of friction and might be willing to accept slightly less control or a slightly fiddlier workflow 
in order to finish the song on the groove box itself. And I think that's something that's good to experiment with both and see what you like better. And maybe you're even willing to sacrifice a bit of sound quality and make something that sounds a bit more rough around the edges for the sake of just finishing something and moving on. I've done that too. And there's another sneaky source of friction that I want to address, and that's a feeling of a lack of inspiration. If you don't have an idea going in or you're not even feeling particularly creative, it can be hard to convince yourself to sit down and start working on music. At least that's the case for me. So for that, I found uh, circumventing it to be really helpful. To give myself an alternate source of ideas other than my brain and whether or not my brain feels inspired. So on a lot of my devices, I have a steady stream of what I like to call song starters. Things like chord one shots, samples and loops that I can chop up. And some devices have song idea generation mechanisms built in, like the Polyon Tracker has the ability to fill in random notes, maybe within a scale. Uh, different devices will have things like arpeggiators or ways to have probability or different scales or chord generators, even full chord progressions that you can do with what you will, like on the MPC-1. I think giving yourself as many little starting points as possible is really helpful from a user's point of view. So when you sit down, you've got something to play around with. Another thing I love to do is load in just a ton of bass one shots for making more kind of aggressive bass music. And for manufacturers, the more idea generation mechanisms you can give your users, the better. Arpeggiators, random notes, maybe within scales, scales, chords, all of this kind of stuff can be incredibly helpful for making a device something that you come back to or random patches. That's something that say the Roland MC-101 has where you can just hit a button and it will either select or generate, I'm still not 100% sure which, a random patch. And hearing just kind of a novel sound can be inspiring for me personally. And manufacturers, I mentioned the sound packs, giving your users a way to load in sound packs is something that I think can really go a long way. Plus, I'm always gonna advocate for battery powered stuff and user interfaces that allow you to do the things that you want to do in as few steps as possible, but regardless. All of these things together can add up. All of these little improvements, all of these little reductions in friction can go from you having a really hard time getting into or keeping a creative session going. You can go from that to having a much higher musical output and have it feel a lot less like you're going against the grain, a lot less like you're pushing a boulder uphill. Hopefully this was interesting or gave you some stuff that might be helpful in your own process, especially if you are in a similar situation to me. If you've got any more tips that you love to use that I didn't mention, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to turn this into kind of a bigger discussion about how to get over friction, especially when associated with music production gadgets. I've got some more related videos for you to check out, but in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. I'll be back with a new video in a little bit.